the million dollar question we got to ask is this was this something that was predictable who would believe the undefeatable Persian breed to show their back to the Romans? Let me ask you, who would believe? Abu Bakr did, and he even made a bet for it. What else can you ask for? There are layers of layers of miracle in this incident. We're going to hear the miracle from the mouth of some of the most known and most credible Western historian. After listening to it, everyone who has the slightest logic will understand if this can be made up by a human or that it has to be a word of God. Orientalist author Richard Bell says, It is hard to explain Muhammad's view for the good of Byzantine Empire's political fate. Not only hard, it's impossible. Unless you believe he's a prophet of God. The claim itself is not absurd enough for someone who doesn't believe in his messengership. Then, hear more. Belief is a single truth composed of six pillars, which cannot be separated into parts. The six pillars are belief in Allah, in his angels, in his books, his messengers, the last day, and destiny. It is a whole that cannot be broken up because each of the pillars of belief proves the other pillars with the proofs that prove itself. They're all extremely powerful proofs of each other. In which case, an invalid idea that cannot shake all the pillars together with all their proofs cannot negate any of the pillars or even a single of their truths and cannot deny them. Today, we're going to take a glance at a single proof of a single pillar and reflect what an indestructible truth and what a luminous and inextinguishable light the light of belief is. The Holy Quran, which is the greatest proof of the existence of Allah, the greatest proof that that Islam is the true religion, the greatest proof that Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is a true messenger and at the same time the greatest miracle of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him has come from the greatest divine name and from the greatest level of every name of Allah. Quran is a miracle whose miraculousness is valid in every moment. It is still valid, still miraculous. For example, Moses peace be upon him showed a miracle. He split the Red Sea into two by will of Allah. But then he said to it, come together again and it rejoined. Jesus peace be upon him performed the miracle. He resurrected the dead by the will of Allah. But then the person died again. The miracles are past. We can't see them anymore. But the Quran started to be revealed in the year 610. Yet, its miracles are still valid and it will continue to be valid until the last day. Today, we're going to talk about Qur'an, a single miracle from Qur'an. And this miracle is going to be a proof of existence of Allah, the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and that Islam is the right religion. Quran has unlimited aspects of miraculousness. Some of the well-known ones are eloquence in its meaning, the uniqueness of its style, the fluency and clarity in its wording, the employment of its words, excellence in its manner of exposition, making understood and instruction, comprehensiveness in its words, comprehensiveness in its meaning, its style and conciseness, preserving its freshness, inimitability in its particularity and so on. But what are these? For example, the mathematical balance in the Quran. The word day appears exactly 365 times, month exactly 12 times. The words Satan and angel, heaven and hell, exactly the same amount of time. This is only a single miraculous aspect. For example, another one is expressing multiple meanings with only a few words. Sometimes with punctuation or even with diacritical marks, it expresses a lot of meanings with just a little. Also, another miraculous aspect is that some ayah come after the other in the Quranic order, but they are revealed sometimes 20 years apart from each other. The two ayah are revealed for two completely different reasons after completely different incidents, but they are put one after the other, complementing each other with perfect sense and smoothness as if it was revealed in one session as a whole. This is one miracle of the Quran too. Another miracle is its giving news of the unseen. Allah tells in the Quran about the things that cannot be known to people. The single aspect within itself also separates into four different branches. One of them is giving news of the unseen of the past to tell about mysteries of the past that can't be known to humans. Another one is giving news of the unseen of currents, telling about what's not known about the current moment. 
The third is giving news of the unseen of future, telling about what's not known about the future. And the fourth one is giving news of the unseen of the truths of creation, telling about what's not known about the universe. In this video, we're going to go over one example of the miracle of giving news of the unseen of future. This miracle is going to be a proof for the existence and oneness of Allah, also the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, and at the same time, a proof of validity of Islam. But before we mention the main miracle, let's talk briefly about the other three. What is giving news of the unseen of past? The Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him tells us about the prophets who lived thousands of years before himself. For example, Prophet Abraham, Prophet David, Prophet Job, Prophet Moses, and Prophet Jesus. Peace be upon all of them. The Quran tells us about their lives as if the owner of its words saw those prophets and witnessed their lives. If you want to claim that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, didn't receive Quran as a revelation from God, or that it's not the word of God, God forbid, or that he wrote the Quran through his knowledge, his intelligence, you need to claim four things. First, you need to reject the unanimous reports of all the people, the believers and non-believers in the history that he, peace be upon him, was an illiterate and you would need to claim that he knew how to read and write. Second, you need to claim that there was a giant library in Mecca at the time, which contains the stories of all the people, all the prophets that are mentioned in the Quran. And we know that there can't be because those prophets came to places all around the world and such a library was impossible to bring together in the 7th century Arabia. Third, you need to claim that Prophet knew each one of those languages that all those prophets speak. And we know that it's impossible because some of those languages were already dead thousands of years ago before the Prophet. And the first translation of them were some of them 600, some of them 1000, some 1100 years after the Prophet peace be upon him. And fourth, you need to accept that Prophet peace be upon him knew which of those stories were correct and which were wrong, so he only took from the correct stories and excluded all that are fake. To claim that giving news of the unseen of the past is from himself and not from God, one first need to accept these four absurd claims. The next miracle is giving news of the unseen of currents. For example, to tell what someone who Prophet peace be upon him is talking to was thinking, or to tell about an incident that took place far away from where he was at that moment. This is giving news of the unseen of currents. The last one before we present the main miracle is giving news of the unseen of creation. In this one, the Quran reveals what what's unknown to people about the universe, the creation. For example, Quran tells us that the universe is not in a static stable form, but it's continuously expanding. Another one, it tells us about the movement of continents. Another one, bringing down the iron from the sky. Another one, creation of the baby in mother's womb in three stages. Another one, it tells us about the plants having male and female types. Another one, clouds carrying large amount of masses, not flowing in the air like a soft tissue, but holding tons in the air. These are telling things about the universe that were not known at the time, that are discovered hundreds of years later as the science develops. This is giving news of the unseen of the truth of creation. Inshallah, we're going to go over these with more detail in the future videos. Out of numberless miraculous aspects of the Quran, we're going to go into one example of one branch of one aspect. Let's start if you guys are ready. The miracles of the Quran are too many and various as we mentioned earlier. But the strength of the miracles is not only in its quantity and variety, but in their quality as well. Like the one that we're going to mention in this video, they are by themselves so powerful that they can single-handedly prove that the Qur'an and therefore all the pillars of Islam are correct. In other words, the strength of belief in the Qur'an is not only built upon horizontal level, that is in the high number of proofs, but they are also carried up by very deep proofs that are single-handedly capable of convincing someone without leaving any doubt. This miracle that we're going to talk about is from Surah Rum. It is the first few ayah at the beginning of the surah. Let's look at the context of these ayah to grasp this miracle properly. By the way, we're not only going to tell the story, but we're going to hear the miracle from the mouth of some of the most known and most credible Western historians. After listening to it, everyone who has the slightest logic will understand if this can be made up by a human or that it has to be a word of God. Let's start. In the early years of the prophethood of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, the early 600s, there were two superpowers in the world. 
The first one was Eastern Rome Empire of Romans, and the second one was Sassanid Empire of Persians. In 603, the Persians started a war with the Romans. The Romans were very weak. They couldn't stand against the Persian army. They had a civil war. And on top of that, in 610, they had a military coup. The governor of Africa, Heraclius, took down the king Phocus, and he became the emperor of Romans himself. At the time he was the emperor, the nation was falling apart. Nothing was going right. The Byzantine historian Alexander Vasiliev says, The new emperor had neither wealth in public treasury, nor enough military power. So Persians started taking lands of Romans. Historian Paul Lamerel says that they were in Antioch in 612 and in Jerusalem in 614. So the Persians kept winning against the Romans and taking their lands. The Romans were taking loss after loss after loss. Susan Y says, Avars were terrorizing Europe and the Persians had wiped out the Roman army. Very few of the experienced soldiers were alive. Heraclius decided to beg, although the condition was appalling. He sent messengers to Kashar II to offer paying tribute money. But the Kashar II was winning, so he declined it. Now, this was the situation in the war. Meanwhile, in Mecca, where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lived at the time, the news about the battle between Persians and Romans were heard. At the time, the Muslims were very few in numbers, and they were facing constant opposition from their tribe. The disbelievers in Mecca were always looking for ways to depress Muslims. They started making propaganda about the issue, because their religion was similar to the Persians and the Muslims religion was more similar to Christianity. They said, just like how Persians who are like us defeated Christians, we will defeat you. Then Surah Rum gets revealed to the Prophet. Its first ayahs go, in the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. Alif Lam Mim. The Romans have been defeated in a nearby land. Yet following their defeat, they will triumph within three to nine years. The whole matter rests with Allah before and after victory. And on that day, the believers will rejoice at the victory willed by Allah. The ayah had a huge claim as a response to their mocking. The claim was that Romans, in complete contrast to what seems to be happening, will defeat the Persians soon. We know that after the ayah, Abu Bakr, may Allah be pleased with him, who was one of the first believers, relied on these ayah and made a bet with Ubay ibn Khalaf, who was one of the leaders of these believers. He bet for 10 camels that Romans will come victorious within 3 years. Because at the time, gambling was not ruled illegal yet, he told about this bet to the Prophet peace be upon him. The Prophet told them that the ayah refers to 3 to 10 years, not up to 3 years. So Abu Bakr went ahead and they agreed to change the conditions of the bet from up to 3 years to up to 10 years and increase the number of camels from 10 to 100. So at this point, one might make an objection and say, how do we know that the surah was not revealed before Sasanians were winning or after the Romans started winning? How do we know that it's accurately dated? There are 7 ways to estimate the date that the ayah was revealed. Please wait until we identify the dating of the ayah because after you're going to see how ridiculous the situation gets. The first, all the Muslim scholars and even Orientalists such as Hartwig Hirschfeld, Richard Bell, Sir William Muir, and Gustav Weil, basically anyone who has researched about the Islamic history have a consensus that the surah was revealed in Mecca period. In the Islamic sources, the revelation time of the surah is generally dated between 616 and 618 by the way. The second, the ayah mentions the words ghulibat and sayaghlibun. Here, ghulibat means have been defeated, which is in the past tense and sayaglibun means will win, pointing to near future. So we can understand that it was revealed when the Romans were losing because if it was to be revealed after the Romans started winning, this would cause a scandal both by believers and disbelievers and it would have spread very quickly because scandals spread very fast and would be present in historical sources. But we don't see anything about such an incident in any of the historical sources. So we see that it was revealed when the Romans were losing. The third, in the ayah it says, this is promise of Allah. This also points that the victory is going to be in the future. The fourth, on that day, the believers will rejoice. This means that when the ayah was revealed, the Muslims were not rejoiced yet and were still under oppression. This means they were in Mecca and this surah is from Mecca period. The fifth, the letters Alif Lam Mim at the beginning tells that the surah is from Mecca period. The sixth, the fact that Ubay ibn Khalaf accepted to change the dates of the bet they made with Abu Bakr and agreed to increase the number of camels also shows that Ubay ibn Khalaf didn't have any expectations of Romans winning. Otherwise, he wouldn't have accepted the offer. This also points that it was revealed when the Romans were losing. The seventh, in the ayah it says Romans were defeated in the nearest land. 
The ayah means both the nearest land, which points to the defeat in Jerusalem, or it can mean the lowest land, where if we look scientifically, in a topological scan, the lowest land in the earth's surface is the Dead Sea, which is right near Jerusalem. So in both ways, it points to Romans' defeat in Jerusalem that happened in 614 or 615 according to historians. But there is another miracle here if you notice. Supposedly, the words of an illiterate man in the 7th century Arabia, God forbid, predicts the lowest point of the earth. Interesting. Anyways, let's move on to our point. So from these signs, we can come up with a precise time interval of when the surah was revealed. According to these inferences, revelation date of the ayah can be 614 the earliest and 618 the latest. It must be revealed between 614 and 618. Okay, now this is where it gets interesting. The claim says that the Romans are going to win. Now, the million dollar question we got to ask is this. Was this something that was predictable? Let's imagine if a human were to come up with that ayah, God forbid. Why would someone make such a statement? God forbid if you were to come up with a Quran, why would you say something like that? There are various reasons not to say it. Before mentioning these reasons, let's examine how predictable this claim was through the words of Western non-Muslim authors. So for the first 11 years after Heraclius became the emperor from 610 to 621. Romans get loss after loss after loss against the Persians. Edward Gibbon says Syria, Egypt, and the provinces of Asia were subdued by the Persian army, while Europe, from confines of Istria to the long wall of Thrace, was oppressed by the Avars. Susan Wise describes the situation like this. While Persians were marching to Constantinople from east, Avars and Slavs were approaching from northwest. The army was finished, crop supply from Africa and Egypt had stopped. At this point, Persians had already taken Egypt, Libya, Syria, Palestine, Anatolia, and Armenia. Gibbon says they went on a march from Euphrates to Dardanelles and they set their camps near Constantinople. They had just come out of a civil war. The country is in chaos. They have no money in treasury and they have no organized military. Heraclius begged to Kashro II. He sent messengers, offered paying tribute money, but Kashro II was winning so he declined. It was all falling down for Romans. Even the king tried to escape the country. Listen to this. August Bailey says, especially in 619, he, meaning Heraclius, decided to run from the empire. Planning to move to Africa, he loaded his treasuries to ships and was ready to take off. Patrick Sergius came and begged for him to change his thoughts. He forced him to come to Grand Church and pray besides him and made him swear oath not to leave his position. At this point, there are six discrepancies here. In this war, which you have heard the conditions of, would you ever give a chance that Romans would win? More so, would you risk your claim that you put everything you love in line for? Your friends, your relatives, that you put them in a great risk for? Would you risk such a huge claim for such a small issue? If you did that, why would you take such a completely unpredictable side that Romans, despite their dead chaotic situation, would come victorious within such a short and precise time? If you did that too, why would you guess about the Romans and Persians? It doesn't even matter for you. It's not even your war. It doesn't even concern you. Why would you claim something like this? And even the king doesn't have a faith in his country. He tries to flee his country. Even he doesn't think that they're going to win. How come you make such a claim? Even the war strategist can't estimate the result of wars because there are so many parameters. What do you rely upon to say that they're going to win? Even if a single ayah states something wrong, you are all exposed. All you stand for is refuted. Why would you say such a thing? The claim itself is not absurd enough for someone who doesn't believe in his messengership. Then hear more. After the ayah was revealed, Romans keep losing for several more years. Remember the ayah says Romans are going to come victorious not right away, but something between 3 to 10 years. So after a few years, there happens a mind-bending change to Heraclius' character. All of a sudden, he turns into a courageous commander. Edward Gibbon words his change like this. When Heraclius assumed a spirit of a hero, the change in his character is so dramatic that historians start comparing him with Alexander the Great and Caesar. Alexander Vasiliev mentions that the 20th century researcher Uspensky compares Heraclius' battles with Alexander the Great's victories. Again, Gibbon narrates, the Arcadius of the palace arose the Caesar of the camp, 
and the honor of Rome and Heraclius was gloriously retrieved by exploits and trophies of six adventurous campaigns. It was the duty of Byzantine historians to have revealed the cause of his slumber and vigilance. Well, listen to this carefully. Of the characters conspicuous in history, that of Heraclius is one of the most extraordinary and inconsistent. In the first and last year of a long reign, the emperor appears to be slave of sloth, of pleasure, or of superstition, the careless and impotent spectator of public calamities. Isn't the reason for Heraclius' change so obvious? Bailey says, After so much courage and valor displayed by Heraclius, he turned into an irresolute, nervous, sissy man, and he became a mere spectator against barbarian invasion of the lands he took through his victories. So mysteriously, after that 10 years of victory, he turns into that lazy man that he once was before for the rest of his life. If there was nothing else, only the change in this person's character was sufficient as a miracle. What else can you ask for? There are layers of layers of miracle in this incident. What else would someone need before they believe? Anyways, Gibbon says Heraclius started war preparations in 621. 621, which is somewhere between 3 to 7 years after the Surah Rum. Susan Weiss says that Heraclius spent the summer educating his army. Seemingly, there were many soldiers who hadn't fought before. Theophanes says he saw that his military was lazy, afraid, unorganized, and undisciplined. So he educated them by facing them against each other with wooden swords. Susan Weiss says, It was unlikely that the army made of infant soldiers would defeat experienced Persian soldiers, but Heraclius decided to try it. Stathokopoulos says, The capital city was saved in a nearly improbable way. Another quote from Gibbon says, Roman emperor explored his perilous way through the Black Sea and the mounts of Armenia and penetrated into the hearts of Persia. Charles William Oman says, No emperor after Julian Caesar hadn't fought for this long and hadn't won such a victory. Theophane says, Who would believe the undefeatable Persian breed to show their back to the Romans? Let me ask you, who would believe? Abu Bakr did, and he even made a bet for it. Heraclius started his war preparations in 621. He started fighting back in 622, took over Armenia in 624. In 627, the last blow was dealt in Nineveh. Orientalist author Richard Bell says, It is hard to explain Muhammad's view for the good of Byzantine Empire's political fate. Not only hard, it's impossible, unless you believe he is a prophet of God. At the end of 10 years, the Romans became victorious. Many people became Muslim because of this incident. Abu Bakr won his bet with Ubay ibn Khalaf. He took his camels from Ibn Khalaf's children because he was dead at the time. And because gambling was ruled illegal at the time, he donated those 100 camels to the poor. Remember, in continuation of the ayah, it says, And on that day, the believers will rejoice at the victory willed by Allah. When the Romans became victorious, Muslims had moved out of Mecca, had their own state, and were freed from the oppression of disbelievers. The rejoice of Muslims here is thought to be referring to the victory in battle of Badr or the victory in battle of Trench. In both cases, Muslims rejoiced at the victory. This, by the way, is another miracle of the ayah. And another miracle is that we can still observe the clarity of this miracle 1400 years later and even with more evidence to give us a general point of view. The miracles and signs become more clear regardless of time and place to the ones who are open to belief. We thank Allah for making His signs clear for us and allowing us to make it all the way through the end of this video. Let us know if you would like to see continuation of the series of miracles of the Quran. You can let us know in the comments or through likes. سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين Take care السلام عليكم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم غلبت الروم في أدنى الأرض وهم من بعد غلبهم سيغلبون في بضع سنين لله الأمر من قبل ومن بعد ويومئذ يفرح المؤمنون بنصر الله ينصر من يشاء وهو العزيز الرحيم وعد الله لا يخلف الله وعده ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون يعلمون ظاهرا من الحياة الدنيا وهم عن الآخرة هم غافلون صدق الله العظيم